That's it. Get comfortable. Okay. I know. It feels odd to be in a uh, me, me doing these podcasts now in person. <laughs> <laughs> it's an odd feeling. It is. You know, I, not having a screen with ten people in front of you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, do you like doing this better than Zoom? I do. Yes. Um, I I always like um, smaller group interactions more. Yeah. So. You know, it's funny. I thought. When I, did, you know, I only did these, and then mm -hmm. we had the pandemic. I had to go to Zoom, and I thought, oh, this is going to be a nightmare. I don't want to do mm -hmm. Zoom. Now I'm like, no, I really actually prefer Zoom. <laughs> um, it, it like it's it's a little bit easier for me in some ways to do those. Um, just it's hard to manage when it's a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. So. Now I've done that. Well, those are in some ways better because then you put no video, mute, and just sit right. back in. Exactly. And do your other thing. Yeah. You can't do this on a one on one. No. Nope. I have James Burns here today. He was kind enough to come in. He came all the way down from Phoenix to visit us. And I've known you for, what do you think, 12, 15 years, maybe? It, believe it or not, it's actually 21 years no, Mark. Oh, God. How's that possible? <laughs> time warp, really? Wow. Yes. Yeah. I knew it was a long time. I just. Things fly, doesn't don't they? It they does, just... since the founding of the Booth Museum. Yeah, okay, so mm -hmm. 20 years, eh, that's about the right, that sounds about right. Mm -hmm. And um, so you have some, uh, we'll just hit the the highlight right now, because we're going to go all the way back okay. to, you know, how you got to where you got, but you've just gotten a, um, a very important, I don't know if you call it a promotion or a job or um honor maybe you want to tell us a little bit about that i th I'd, I'd call it a, a new post and a return to my home discipline so yes i recently was honored with the an offer for the executive directorship for western spirit scottsdale's museum of the west and it's a like i said a return to western art for me which i'm thrilled about and that takes place in October when you change over from Mike Fox. Is that correct? That's correct. Mike Fox was the founding director of Western Spirit. And uh, he's been with them, I think, since 2009 when it was still just an idea. Yeah. Yeah. He is uh, an interesting guy that I want to get on. He's promised me he'll come on. But, you know, maybe once you get on to taking over the position, he'll <laughs> have a little more time to do it. Yes. So this, you actually are going to begin this in the gala. They have a gala, right? In October the 16th or something? Right, exactly. The the Saddle Up annual gala. It's the second annual, I believe, and that will be my official debut with the museum. So <laughs> That's such a hard thing to do. <laughs> it is, although I've had similar experiences in the past. Uh, like when I uh, interviewed for the directorship at Desert Caballeros Western Museum, and my final interview was being observed for all four days of Cowgirl Up opening weekend. And you weren't even the music. They didn't hadn't hadn't made you the museum director. They just said, "No, you have four. We were going to be doing this for four days. Please join us." And you said, "Well, I can come for one day." And they go, "No, no, please join us for four days." <laughs> That's exactly how it went. Yes. <laughs> oh my god. And, and uh, it, you know, it was very smart of them. It was a wise move because they got to observe how I interacted with every different kind of stakeholder of the museum. Yeah, and you got the job, so clearly it worked. <laughs> so now, are you from Arizona? I'm not. I'm an I'm I'm an Arizonan. I always say I was born a Northeasterner, but I never really fit in. I was born in Rochester, New York. I was a Southerner by choice. My career took me there, but at at heart, I'm a Westerner. And um, I've been in Arizona on and off most of my adult life since I uh, came here at age 17 to start uh, my undergraduate work at the University of Arizona. Oh yeah, so you kind of really are an Arizonian. So, but you grew up in the Northeast. Where yes. where'd you grow up in Rochester? Just outside of. Rochester, New York. So a city that is, you know, very steeped in the arts and, and culture of all kinds, thanks to the, the generosity of George Eastman and many others. Yeah, what are the museums that are in Rochester? <laughs> Uh, some some of the big ones are uh, you, was was founded in 1981 as the uh, Margaret Woodbury Strong Museum, now known as the National Museum of Play. It's a mm -hmm. fascinating story behind that. Of course, the George Eastman House, the uh, Rochester uh, Science Center. 
um, and my personal, probably the first little museum I ever went to, the Stone Tolan House, which I, I probably went to in the fourth grade, and that birthed my love of museums. Now, what is that? What is it? A, it's a little historic house that dates back to, I think, the 1700s, and uh, we went there on a school field trip, so I'm living proof that, uh, you know, field trips to museums can birth careers. Yeah, did you remember? I mean, you really remembered it. Really made an impact. Oh, what grade were you in? I would say probably the fourth or fifth grade. Yeah, and what was it you think about that place that um, tripped your trigger? I just uh, the, a, a fascination with with things. Honestly, old things. I always loved history as a kid. Mm -hmm. um, Little known thing about me is I actually don't tell anyone I don't have any degrees in art or art history. Yeah. I was a historian by training. You know, to me, that's the same thing. You know, it follows the same logic, the same thing you do. I don't have, I've never taken a class in art history. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever taken a class in history, actually, <laughs> but I love history and I read about history constantly. Um, I think I had English literature history once, which was horrific, actually. <laughs> I, I didn't care for it at all, but I do love history. And so um, what did your folks do? Oh, goodness. I'm, um, it's a pretty incredible story. I'm first generation college educated on either side of the family, uh, let alone to have a terminal degree. My, my dad was a postman for 30 years. Mm. And um, my, my mom worked in the office at the uh, school that I went to. You know, being a postman is, uh, I, I bet that has that taught you a lot of things because that's a guy who has to get up and do his job every day. Mm -hmm. You know, the proverbial, you know, snow, sleet, rain, yep. you know, and he did and and did it as a career for 30 years. And what do you think that had to have taught you some certain things about life? I'm sure he must have given you some of those. Yeah, I mean, he, he certainly uh, it taught me about perseverance. Yeah, I for sure. Think, yeah. Um, and there's, and just, just because, um, uh, of his work ethic, I, I think I also picked up, um, a lot about determination. I, I jokingly always say I'm nothing if not persistent and determined. That is true about you. No, that's really true. <laughs> it is. Yeah. You are very persistent. Yeah, it really is. Right. You know, I would put that right as one of your top characteristics. You have to be to run a cultural institution. Um, uh, the, these things are not easy uh, uh, jobs. Everyone thinks that they're so glamorous. And I think, <laughs> I mean, I love what I do, but I also think to myself, oh my goodness, if I could go back to the days that I was in college and and I knew, and, and I don't mean this in, the, in, the, um, in a bad sense of the word, but I never understood what political organizations, cultural organizations are. Yeah. And you have to be persistent and determined to move things forward. Yeah, because there is a real political component, no mm -hmm. doubt about it. Mm -hmm. I'm still figuring that part out, actually. That's <laughs> true. And I, I don't want to be a part of that, actually. I just want to, I just want to do my thing. Yeah. And so you, so you get inoculated, really, at, in the fourth grade to museums and history. Mm -hmm. And you did you, did that follow through in high school? And were you doing anything in arts at all, as far as making art, creating art, or any of that? Um, photography. Not a lot of people know that about me. I I don't really share it with a lot of people. Just you do now. Per, yeah, personally for fun. But uh, yeah, I took photography classes and some writing classes in in high school. So I always say that uh, my writing is is my art, really. Um, and I, I took a lot of uh, advanced uh, history classes um, through a community college while in high school. So I actually had some college credits going into college. And that really should have been a clue that, that history was the field that I should follow, but I didn't. I had another passion. I actually came to the University of Arizona specifically because of their, their program in horticulture. Mm. And I had four majors in the first two years at the U of A and still managed to uh, get done in four years. What, I, what were the four? <laughs> I went from horticulture to 
Uh, and it was the whole science part. I did not do well in soils. So that was the end <laughs> of horticulture. I, that is a t-shirt. <laughs> if I've ever seen one. <laughs> yes. I did not do well in soils. I did not. And I moved on to uh, um, interior design and then decided I was actually more interested in um, landscapes instead and became a landscape architecture major. And... Uh, the math and drawing part tripped me up. And, you know, I, I touched base with my counselor at the university, and he looks at my transcript and he's like, you've got all these history classes. Do you, do you, you know, like you don't need all those. I had taken them for fun as a freshman. <laughs> I petitioned my way into senior level, master's level history classes, and I was getting A's. And, and finally, he just said, you know, have you thought about history? And I was like, <laughs> well, I haven't. And so he, he's like, well, what do you think you want to do with that? And I was like, I don't know. And he points to this chart on the wall. I'll never forget careers in history. And museum curator is what jumped out at me. And that is, that is how I got started in museums. Wow. Isn't that interesting that even though it's clear that you loved it, that you didn't see a route to this. I guess you had no mentor or anybody to tell you until that moment. I, I didn't. And, and also partly my, my parents' reaction to that major change was telling, they're like, you know, panic, like, we're paying for you to get a degree. Are you going to be able to get a job with that? And so I think it was a little bit of that. Like, what do you, is this a, is this a sustainable major? Yeah. And I'm here to tell you it is. <laughs> and did they kind of try to push you into something else? Um, no, they were okay with it. They they trusted in it because they well knew my passion for history since I was a kid. Every every single family vacation, they were all rolling their eyes because we had to go to every single museum wherever we were at. <laughs> it's so interesting that you hadn't figured it out until you're probably twenty. Uh, I yeah, I was nineteen, and my advisor said, "Okay, you think you want to do this?" Um, Here's my friend's name. Um, you need to go talk to her and volunteer for the Arizona State Museum. And I did. And that led to a paying student job. Mm -hmm. I, I instantly fell in love with um, collections and museums the first day I was volunteering. And honestly, like I said, that led to a part-time job. And I've had a paying job in a museum since I was 19. What, what do you think it is about those museums that really trips your trigger um for me it's um it's a sense of wonder it's a sense of possibility it's uh i i i think i've evolved i i initially enjoyed them as contemplative spaces um now i'm actually enamored with them as um a ray of hope as a space for addressing the challenges that face our our society today yeah isn't that amazing how much they've changed and evolved mm -hmm. and they they have and they do and i think most museum directors are looking at it uh, in that way I, I i really do it's it's their potential as informal lifelong learning environments mm -hmm. at the at the core of what i i do i'm an educator um my doctorate's actually not in history it's an educational policy mm -hmm. social and cultural foundations of education so you know studying things like how how gender, class, and race play out in terms of inequities in education and looking at the possibilities of informal learning uh, spaces like museums to address those things. Mm -hmm. And so you finished your degree at the U of A, right? Or I did my undergrad there. I'm the product of three state schools, my undergrad at the U of A, my master's in public history at Arizona State University, mm -hmm. and then my doctorate uh, is from uh, Georgia State University in Atlanta. And so when you finished your, you did you go from undergrad to master's and then to a position? Yes. yes. I figured it must have been because the Georgia thing is right there. And so after you finished your master's, mm -hmm. you started looking for a job? Uh, I, I did. And, it, you know, um, it was it was a it was a tough environment, not like uh, unlike now. I mean, 94, I, I'm. 
dating myself, but I, I graduated in 94 with my master's and um, I basically uh, was, was willing to take what I could get to keep my foot in the door and worked uh, in a series of temporary jobs, a uh, year for the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation at, in Williamsburg, Virginia, a year with the, uh, or a couple of years with the Museum of Northern Arizona, which is an interesting story for us to touch on later. It, it's really a full circle kind of story, a year with the Louisiana State Museum, and then eventually I landed in Atlanta. Yeah, so four, four jobs, four different things. Mm -hmm. And during that period of time, are you going, wait a minute, this may be harder to find what I want? Or you're so young, it just all seemed exciting. There was actually a fifth, the Phoenix Museum of History for a couple of years. And um, I, don't, I don't know about exciting necessarily. I was young and right. I wasn't thinking about um, 401ks and retirement right. and things like that. <laughs> And I had the energy to work a second job. That's a that that's that is an issue in this field. Uh, the the pay in museums. I worked a uh, I worked many other jobs um, in the evening to actually pay the bills, mm -hmm. so I could keep my foot in museums. Wow! So you really had to want it. Mm -hmm. And so you end up getting a job offer in Cartersville. Well, um, what actually took me to Atlanta was um, a an opportunity with the Atlanta History Center. Hmm. And I was there for the first couple of years. And then I saw this intriguing advertisement in the Regional Museum newsletter that I just couldn't resist. And I still remember exactly what it read. It's a new museum, Atlanta area, seeks curator fax resume. Oh, the days when we still used fax machines. <laughs> and I did fax it. And um, I believe I was the first person that interviewed for that job, and I got it. Yeah, and this is at the uh, in Cartersville at the booth? That's correct. So that new museum in Atlanta was, um, was literally just a concept at the time. Mm. Uh, it was, it was uh, created by the founders July 4th of 2000, and uh, I joined them in mid-August of that year. So the first mm. day, we were looking at blueprints for what, for what the museum would become wow. eventually. And you, and you loved Western art, right, and native arts? Yes, I, uh, similar to you, I came. I came to that in a little bit of a roundabout way. I I, I particularly enjoy um, co-mingling disciplines, mm -hmm. um, particularly art and history, but can be art and another humanity um, discipline. Uh, so I had focused as a master's student both on social and environmental history of the 20th century American West, which of course led me to the writers and artists colonies in Santa Fe and Taos. And mm. so that's that's kind of how I came to it. Um, so I had the background, the, the historical knowledge, um, not so much the, the principles and, and elements of art background. Mm. And so... Because Booth, the Booth Museum is a Western museum. Yes. Pretty much exclusively, I guess, right? Close. I mean, yep. it, I mean, it has Native American stuff. It does have a very strong history museum mm -hmm. associated with it. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was probably there. That at least the museum wasn't when you were doing your thing, was it? They had, had, did they build that uh, when you were there? It, it actually was, yes. I mean, um, some of that little museum had been there for quite a long time, but um, it was in a different a different building. So, yeah, the, um, uh, shall we say, the, the cultural empire that has been built in Cartersville is quite remarkable. Yes, and it is. And began at the, during the, the years I was there. And was Seth Hopkins working there yet? Yeah, he hired me. Yeah. yeah absolutely. He was he was their first employee. That's what I thought. I, I didn't know this for a fact, but mm -hmm. I wanted to get the chronology. And we did a podcast on Seth. So. Oh, wonderful. And, and Seth likes to say it's the longest one we've done. I think it might be. I think <laughs> he still may have the record for time. Um, and for those who don't know about the Booth Museum, it's really a fantastic museum. And a shout out to the, to mm -hmm. the, to the place. I mean, they're supportive of dealers, they're supportive of artists. And um, they have some great art there. So they that, do. It was uh, a privilege to have a chance to launch my career in Western art there. And I, I just visited again a couple months ago. I love going back. Yeah, I bet. 
and and it keeps growing, right? I mean, they're still throwing money at it, right? It keeps it keeps growing, and it keeps gaining um, more and more support from the Western art world. So yeah, it's yeah. Uh, rightly so too, yeah. I think. And so, while you're doing that job, and what was your title was it well i was initially hired as the museum curator but again i was in on the ground floor i was one of the first people that they hired and uh and and so i actually eventually grew into a position as we began to hire more people and i had the title of director of curatorial services so i i oversaw most of what i call the museum side of things the library archives curatorial mm. collections management exhibitions yeah so everything basically <laughs> a lot of everything right right and so how long are you there? Because at some point while you're there, you start a PhD program, right? Correct. Um, I was there for a total of seven years and I, um, I did begin the PhD program in 2002 and I finished the coursework and the comps pretty quickly. And then a job opportunity came up in, in Arizona. And I, you know, I've, I've talked about it, it's my adopted home, and I really wanted an opportunity to come back to Arizona, yeah. so I, I took that. Yeah, and which job was that? Um, it, it's one not a lot of people know about in my background, but I, I was actually brought back here as the city historian for the city of Tempe. Oh, interesting. And for three years, I worked on a, a project to... Uh, uh, bond funded project to renovate all of the exhibitions at the tempe history museum oh yeah doby town that's mm -hmm. what dixon used to call it because mm -hmm. it was all doby <laughs> right <laughs> yep. and so and how long did you do that for a couple of years for three years and you know unfortunately uh it was a case i i was hired in uh June of 2007, so for anyone doing the math, just before the Great Recession. Yeah. And uh, it was a case of uh, last one in, first one out. Yeah, right. And, um, you know, I, I made it for three years, but uh, but then um, just at the right moment, uh, and in fact, just as I was finishing my dissertation and graduated, I, I was offered another opportunity to go back to Western art. And was that the Desert Cavaleros? Or? That was, yes. Yeah. So uh, within three weeks of one another, I was offered my first directorship at Desert Caballeros Western Museum and finished my doctorate. Very good. Yeah, and you, and you worked on Mary Russell Farrell Colton, yes. right? Yeah, let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so I can tell you how that, the fascination with the Museum of Northern Arizona began. I, right. I've, I've joked with uh, successive directors there that I really... If I ever published anything, I owe them royalties because I built my academic career on that institution. And so I was taking a, a, a class in history at ASU and had gotten a good piece of advice from an advisor um, that the way to finish your master's in a couple of years is find a topic you're interested in and use every seminar, seminar to write a little bit about that. Uh, so I did. My first semester there, I, I, I did a paper about the, um, you know, the, the influence of the Museum of Northern Arizona as a cultural institution on the Colorado Plateau mm. and um, ended up writing my master's thesis uh, as, a, as a, a history of the institution itself. And it's 1928, is that when it began? 1928, it just... Is that impressive? I actually can remember that. I have no idea why yeah, I know that. That's I correct. In fact, it me. was just, just a couple days ago, they had an anniversary because their director posted about it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's such a... I think I remember it actually because I just love the museum mm -hmm. so much. I mean, I think it's such a wonderful museum. And again, for those who have not gone to the Museum of Northern Arizona, I highly encourage it. It has... An amazing collection. The building is remarkable. The setting is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And it combines different aspects from fossils to right. native to... Initially, their mission was focused on, I, I think this is right, the biology, anthropology, paleontology, and fine art of the Colorado Plateau. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's about right. It's, mm -hmm. It still kind of is. And then... Mary Russell Farrell Colton, how did you land on her? So after writing the the uh, 
the master's thesis, which was called Gateway to the Colorado Plateau, a portrait of the Museum of Northern Arizona, I never forgot about Mary Russell. I always felt like she was the, you know, the the overlooked and super interesting um, uh, character in in the museum's founding. And um, by no means was she a shrinking violet. She certainly didn't take a back seat. It's just that, um, as we often see uh, in in history, um, you know, her husband was more written about than she was. Yeah. And I felt like she'd not gotten her due. And so um, all of those years later, uh, what it would be, it'd be eight, nine years later, when I started the, the um, doctoral program, you know, I was thinking about the, the possibility of focusing on her through a lens that nobody had ever done before, which was looking at everything that she did in her life. She was an educator. Mm, and yeah, I had to have so. an education focus for the dissertation. And uh, and it ended up being perfect when I moved back here because I had easy access to go up to the collection and um, do the research. And there were still people alive who knew her and I was able to do oral mm. histories. And um, so, yeah, it, it uh, again, it focuses on her her work as, as a... Uh, amateur archaeologist, as an ethnographer, as an author, an artist, a mom, a wife, a rancher, a curator. She was always educating. Yeah, she was very important to the Hopi people and getting them to go back to really to, to discovering their own roots, so mm -hmm. to speak. And that, I think, was a, 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 tr a terrifically important component to Native mm -hmm. American art. And you can see a lot of those early Hopi pieces that were done and drawings that were done at, mm -hmm. you know, at the museum still. And, I mean, her paintings are, she was insanely good. She was very good. And, you know, it's, there's, um, you know, bes besides what, uh, you've been able to ferret out more of them than anyone that I know. <laughs> Um, but you know, she, she was not prolific. No. Think, think about all of the things that I just said that she was doing. Plus she was, she was co-founding a museum right. and running it. And despite protestations, uh, to the, to the contrary, they were, it was their vision. It was largely their financing, uh, that drove that institution for the first 30 years. And so she was doing so many other things. She didn't have time to be a prolific painter. And and then also, you don't see a lot of it in the marketplace, at least not until maybe recent years, because you have to remember, she, she came from some means. Right. And she never really had to paint for a living. Right. So she did it for the love of doing it. And most often... She, she would gift them. So they went to friends, they went to families and- uh, and, Museums. And, and museums, and not a lot of it entered the marketplace. Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, and she's academically trained in Philadelphia. Right. You know, it's a very important, you know, back career with her. I say there's probably like 400 pieces out there, that's my guess. And that would probably include uh, studies. Yeah, that yeah. includes all the little ones. Oh, yeah, yeah yep, for sure. That's right. And one of the things that's interesting about her, even her studies that because she did come from means, they always had great frames. She always <laughs> spent did. money on really Nuka Macum <laughs> frames and things like that. Yes. And um, you were able to get one, a great one for the museum that you're working at during this time, which is the Wickenburg Museum. And right. in fact, you promoted and had a show yep. of her work. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that really helped, helped that solidify a little bit of what was you know, her legacy. Mm -hmm. We actually did a, a couple of shows that year. We did two different shows of her work. Um, uh, that would have been the Arizona Centennial Year 2012. It was a Centennial Legacy Project mm. that was jointly curated b with the Museum of Northern Arizona. Uh, and so uh, Dr. Alan Peterson and I co-curated that 
uh, and it, it showed in Flagstaff and yep. then traveled to Wickenburg. And um, then later in the year, we did a show that focused more on uh, the work that she did with uh, Native American artists, um, Hopi and Navajo, both. And so we we had a show um, that featured a, a lot of the... Um, a lot of the art objects that they had produced that clearly showed some influence uh, from the work that she had done. Mm -hmm. And so now one of the things you'll have to do, of course, is find one for the, the Scottsdale Museum of the West. Good luck, <laughs> by the way. Good luck. <laughs> I know. Ex exactly. There's, there's not a lot of them out there. No. Um, but uh and and i i frankly i think you've found all the best ones so. I've had, yeah i know and jim ballinger was able to snag one out of my collection for the phoenix art museum yes <laughs> good for jim good for everybody it was nice actually it's called a lonesome hole to go see it hanging in the museum there is something gratifying about seeing one of your paintings that was hanging in your bedroom and then it's hanging in a, on a major wall. When I go back to Desert Caballeros, the first thing that I do, no matter what fascinating new exhibit I'm there to see, I go to the room where the Mary Russell Farrell Colton has been hanging <laughs> yeah. since, since they acquired it. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Good for you for getting that, by the way. <laughs> Another one. <laughs> that's the one you said you'd never sell. It's <laughs> true. I know. I'm sad, but I'm glad it's there. I get to enjoy it as well. Yeah. And so you're at, so you get the job at Desert Caballeros. Mm -hmm. And um, what was that whole process like? You were there for quite a while. I was there for quite a while. It was almost five years. And, um, uh, you know, it really be began a, a theme in in my career, which I think um, is 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 only now um, changing, and I'll explain what that means in a little bit. But I, you know, I kind of unintentionally made a career out of directorships at institutions that needed a needed a change agent, mm. and um, you know, I inherited a, a situation there where, let's just say they were they were they were not in the best. Uh, financial straits during the Great Recession, yeah, and um, it's a it's. I often tell this when I um, talk to students about my career. That board knew that that institution didn't have any more chances, and yet um, we took a chance on each other. Think about that for a minute. I'd never been a museum director. That was my first directorship, and they knew. This couldn't go sideways. And, you know, it actually was a great motivator because uh, I, knew, I understood based on the level of confidence and trust that they had in making that hire that um, failure was not an option. And so we really turned it around. We did the first capital campaign in 27 years. Mm. We uh, had a goal of about 1.3 million and ended up raising 2.75 wow. during a recession. Yeah, a bad one too. And that allowed for the um, construction of what is known as, as their Cultural Crossroads Learning Center, which is a great multi-purpose facility. Um, renovation of a lot of the galleries, the addition of a great um, audio tour, and honestly, not sexy stuff, s just fixing a lot of infrastructure, which I'm still really proud of because it's set them up for um, where they are today, which is, is now thinking about what's the next leap they're going to take. Yeah. Well, one of the things they do have is a great collection. They do. They yeah. do. And... Uh, Again, it's one of these hidden gems, and I always, whenever I get close enough to go over there, I go see it. Just, I mean, they have Morans and Remingtons and Dixons and, you know, all these amazing it's pieces. It's an interesting story. Um, it, 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 it helps when you have an heir to the Fisher Scientific Instruments fortune yeah. behind you. Is that what it was? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And uh, so... You know, and at the, well, the Western art world obviously was very different in the 1970s when they began building that collection. And so, you know, wouldn't you love to go back to 1972 and pick up a Remington or a Russell? Yeah. For those prices. Yeah, or just be able to get them, really, yeah. at any prices. Right. Because I'm sure even in 72, though they, you know, nothing compared to today, they still were, you know, there was a lot of competition mm -hmm. uh, coming from Fort Worth, actually. 
Um, yes. So what actually happened is the, that museum was officially founded in 1960. It finally got a building in an old general store in 1969. I believe it was uh, 1974, I think is right. Uh, just before Christmas, it burned to the ground. Mm. And they lost everything but a couple of couple of those bronzes that I mentioned mm -hmm. um, that allegedly fell into the rubble in the basement and were saved. Whether that is actually true or not, I don't know, but a couple bronzes survived. And a, it was a grassroots effort uh, uh, in the community to rebuild the museum, to, to build the collection again. And that's the point at which it really, uh, the, the art side of its mission became, started to become more prominent. They didn't have a lot of art before the fire. Mm. They were founded as the Maricopa County Historical Society. Uh, and it's really the uh, the influence of Aiken Fisher and his wife, who, who most of that art never even hung in their homes. They purchased it for the museum. Wow. Over 80 incredible pieces that are in the collection today. Yeah, one person. That just shows you how one person, if they really want to put the effort and energy they can make a big difference in a in an institution and he was a mentor uh i had board members when i was there between 2010 2014 um i had board members who even all those years later said i i would say how'd you get involved with the museum and they would say well aiken fisher was my friend and mentor and he taught me to appreciate this and so his legacy lives on today wow. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, again, I go off into that museum just to see that, those works of art. Mm -hmm. And they're continuing to to add to their to their holdings. Good pieces, too. Exactly. Yeah. So you, at some point, Nate, make the next trip. <laughs> uh, yeah, I did. And, you know, I, I came here to Tucson. And um, I'll be really candid with you and the audience and say... I learned a great lesson from the choice that I made, which is never, ever underestimate the value of passion for an institution's mission. Directors are not plug and play. I saw a very tantalizing opportunity to come back to my to my undergraduate alma mater. And I, um, I took on the directorship for the University of Arizona Museum of Art, um, which similarly, um, uh, you know, was was trying to uh, prepare to get reaccredited again and to raise its profile both in the community and at the university. And um, that was a, a very different kind of opportunity to, um, I don't think I fully understood what it was going to be like to run about a $1.4 million organization that lived within a $2 billion a year organization. Mm. And, um, you know, you're fighting for attention with the literally the Osiris Rex mission. <laughs> and uh, while I was there, um, the, the directorship at the Center for Creative Photography became vacant and... Um, so I simultaneously inherited interim directorship of that for almost half of the three years that I was here in Tucson. Mm -hmm. And so when that ended, mm -hmm. you went to the Historical Society, right? Uh, not immediately, actually. You know, I um, I got got married in 2017, uh -huh. and my spouse and I decided it was it was finally time to live in one city. Yeah. So uh, I moved to Phoenix, and I consulted for about a year, actually, with collectors, with artists, uh, and with museums, um, uh, really focusing more on, on the art side than the history side. And then... Um, I was encouraged to apply for the directorship at the Arizona Historical Society when it came vacant after uh, a long time tenure for for my predecessor, and uh, it was the first time they had ever done a national search for a director. And uh, lo and behold, they found one uh, right in their own town. <laughs> well, that uh, that year that you did consulting, mm -hmm. what did you take away from that? Because that had to be very interesting because you got to see the other side of the coin, so to speak. Uh, there were there were things that I uh, that I loved about it. Um, <laughs> 
I'll tell you something self-deprecating. Much like uh, artists, uh, some of them uh, are not great at marketing themselves. Right. Um, yeah, I consulted for a year and I never actually managed to launch my website. So I <laughs> learned that uh-huh. I was not good at self-promotion um, and it was actually my longtime reputation in the field that you know work just came my way. Yeah. Um, and I, I, what I learned was that um, there's something very tantalizing about um, being able to go into an organization and do a project and hand it off and then say, it's all yours now, um, rather than having to implement it. The downside of that is you really don't have a voice in shaping the vision and the direction of the institution. Um, you can give their your advice, which may or may not be taken. Um, and honestly, when it comes down to it, I think I think if they're if they tell you the truth, most directors do what they do because um, the ability to shape the vision and direction of an institution is kind of addicting. Yeah, I could see that. Mm-hmm. Well, you leave you leave a legacy. You do. Yeah, I mean. Jim Ballinger, for example. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> no matter what they may have changed in that museum, his legacy is is definitely set and always will be. And you know, I don't. Uh, I I've had shorter tenures where where I've I've been uh, um, as opposed to Jim. I don't think I'll ever have a legacy like him. But what I always uh, do the first day of a new job is start out saying you're going to leave this institution better off than you found it. Yeah. Well, that's all you can hope for, really, I think. Mm-hmm. And so <clears throat> after the year of consulting, then you took the Arizona historical job. You got That was the national search, and they yep. found you in your back pocket. And that's right. been very successful. You've done some amazing things for that organization. Um, thank you very much for saying that. I think, um, you know... There's it's uh, in in the times that we live in being a director of any cultural organization is is really challenging and um, there's uh, there's people out there that feel the same way as you and and then there's people out there that maybe maybe feel otherwise but it you know uh, it's one of those situations where um, I was I was brought in as a change agent. Uh, it's just that not everybody received that message. <laughs> um, and, and change is just hard. Yeah. It's particularly hard in the, in, in the world that we live in today. And um, so, you know, my, my charge there was, was kind of, um, was threefold. Um, you know, uh, f- uh, reorganize the institution and find ways to create efficiencies. Um, ensure that it gets reaccredited by the American Alliance of Museums and make sure that it's prepared for its next sunset review, which every state agency has to go through periodically. And has it gone through that process? Um, it, it is coming up for its sunset review in a couple of years. Yeah. And so we have been able to, um, I think, definitively address and close out like 21 of 23 findings from our last review so it's close it's it's well prepared and tell me a little bit about that organization so because it's got museums all over the place right does is a very large and complex organization um i never really thought about about it until we actually began the search for a new director and someone said um, we have to have a systems thinker. And I said, what's a systems thinker? I didn't come from the, from the business world. And, and this person said, well, it's you. And, <laughs> and then, you know, they talked more and I kind of understood you, 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 I ran the organization in a very different way. Um, prior to me, it was kind of like, you know, five or six different organizations, honestly, because mm-hmm. as you said, it had multiple historic sites and and two flagship museums, and we're all over the state from from Yuma to Flagstaff and Tucson to Tempe, and let's not forget Strawberry and Douglas. And so, um, it's a lot of different um, stakeholders. Um, it's a it's a lot of boards. It's a lot of volunteers. 
it's uh you know it's a it's a it's a 4.5 million dollar budget and a staff of almost 50 mm. and and it's an organization that is um steeped in tradition it is the oldest cultural institution in the state it was founded in 1864 by the territorial legislature wow that yes. really is early yes 1864 that has to be one of the earliest ones in the west um, uh, among them, uh, yeah, yeah, certainly. And so, you know, we're, we only slightly precede the, uh, the Arizona State Museum founded in 1893. Yeah, I remember that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is, that one was the earliest one. I think one of the earliest state mm -hmm. museums. Yes. So you are finishing that position up now. Right. You have gotten kind of your dream job, wouldn't you say, at this point? It is my dream job. Or at job. least we hope it is. <laughs> you never um, know, right, until so you take it over. But it seems like, it, to me, <laughs> just looking at all the things you've done, and I know what you love and what you're interested in, right. you get an institution that has a, an amazing building, um, people that are really enthusiastic about the museum, mm -hmm. not only in Scottsdale, but places like myself here. And you get to lead it into the next generation really well back to determination i'm i'm determined it's going to be the dream job and hopefully the one i i a long time from now retire in um it's uh it, it's a it's a fascinating time um for this opportunity it's it's a good time for me to kind of put a a punctuation mark on my tenure at AHS. We did receive uh, AAM accreditation for the first time ever. It's for the whole organization statewide, which is a pretty remarkable um, achievement when you consider that less than 3% of all museums in the U.S. are accredited. Yeah, wow, that's, a, that's amazing. So it's a nice it's a nice way. It's a nice way to hand that off to a new uh, a new leader for the organization, and um, it's an incredible honor to be handpicked to lead Western Spirit and and to follow uh, you know someone whose career I have admired for decades now. Not everybody knows I actually I worked for Mr. Fox early in my career, 27 years ago. He hired me at the Museum of Northern Arizona to be the photo archivist. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, and here he is uh, hiring me again. Yeah, he's an amazing guy. I mean, he's always at that museum working. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, he's just, he's a, it, it, it is a hard act to follow. There's no, no doubt about that. For sure. <laughs> but you will follow, and it does have to go on, and he's kind of uh, obviously blessed you to, 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 to make sure that you... Uh, as he's given you his permission, I guess, in a weird way. Um, so what do you think are going to be the challenges coming into the museum? Is this, it's a city-owned museum, right? Scottsdale owns this museum, correct? Um, it's a little, uh, that relationship is a little bit misunderstood. The, the, fun, the, the building was actually built and is owned by the city. It was built with, um, with uh, BBB tax money. So mm -hmm. um, that's an important point. Um, it's, it's never been funded through uh, citizen tax dollars. Mm. So it's, you know, it's tourism money. And um, so they do own that gorgeous building and, uh, and they contract with uh, Western Spirit to, to run the museum and out of that facility. And, uh, and they've been doing that now for, for six years. Mm -hmm. um, it's been open just about six years right now. So um, I think the challenges are really, really different. Going back to something that I said before about, um, you know, having built a career as a change agent, um, I won't say no, that change is inevitable, but uh, that's not the role here. Mm -hmm. It's got a great foundation. It has a, a, a wonderful board and staff and um, set of stakeholders that support the institution. What it needs to really do, I think, is, is differentiate itself from its peer organizations. I think that is um, it, it's a challenge that it faces. Um, I, I know that I, I personally, especially having led it and that I love it, I don't, I don't look at our sister institution in Wickenburg as a uh, competition. I look at them as a, a collaborator, mm -hmm. but I, 
but I also understand that we we have to uh, really think carefully about about how what what Western spirit is. Um, and I and I hear a lot of people say it's it's more than a museum. I think it can be too. And um, I'm looking forward to. Uh, leading a lot of different sets of stakeholders and conversations about what it could become. Mm -hmm. um, it has a great opportunity because it's new. It doesn't have, though it took a heck of a long time, three decades just about to get it built, um, it doesn't have a lot of institutional baggage. Mm. It's It's got more of a clean slate as a new museum. So I think that, you know, the changes, the, 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 the challenges will be um, differentiating it, making sure it's sustainable for many decades to come. Um, and, and the same thing as for all museums, relevancy. It's, go, you know, it, 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 has a, it has a traditional audience. And it's going to have to figure out how to become relevant to uh, both younger and more, and I mean this in every sense of the word, uh, more demographically diverse audiences um, in order to, con to be sustainable. Yeah. Well, and it has things like the Herd Museum, which, you know, I, I wouldn't, to me, it's not a competition. But there are lap overs that, mm -hmm. you know, that you see um, and, you know, which is the herd is an amazing place. And then you have Phoenix Art Museums, the Scottsdale Contemporary Art Museum, mm -hmm. the Historical Museums, um, Wickenburg Museum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there is a lot of um, museums that are out there, mm -hmm. not to mention the Musical Museum, which actually has done extremely well. I wonder if you might consider using any of the things that they, they've seemed to really have done a really wonderful job. I think there are, there's a lot of things that they do very well uh, in terms of how they approach the experience that guests have there. Yeah. And so there's certainly some things that can be added. Some of them already have been. Um, during the pandemic, a very generous donor uh, gave the funds that were necessary to create an audio tour for Western Spirit, which now, because of the pandemic, hardly anyone has even experienced yet. Mm. So there are more enhancements like that coming. Um, and I also think that there, there are opportunities for us to collaborate more closely with the universities and not just not just the discipline of art and art history um, but multiple disciplines mm -hmm. um, because you know the the mission and the vision of western spirit as it, it's written now is really looking at the west as as a region as a space as a state of mind mm. um uh, more than just a, a, a place, and um, I think that there's a lot of disciplines that can can um, play into that. Mission. Yeah, I like that a state of mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes that that makes sense to mm -hmm. to to focus on that kind of sensibilities, mm -hmm. and it is a state of mind, quite frankly. And mm -hmm. they have the artwork. They have you know Tim Peterson, who's been so generous with that museum to loan pieces and. Now you have this amazing Curtis show, which is going to come under your watch, right? It is. It's 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 basically my debut, and <laughs> um, you know, even though I didn't, I can take no credit. I didn't have anything to do with it, but um, I'll be there to enjoy it the day that it opens. And we're incredibly um, appreciative of Tim's generosity in in loaning it, and I, you know, I think our challenge with that exhibition is going to be to convey to the general public what you and Tim and I and others in the inner circle know about how incredibly special that particular collection is. Um, again, that goes back to the relevancy. Right. We have to figure out how to explain that to the general public, like, um, don't wait, this is a must-see. Yeah, I mean, I think that exhibit is going to be world class. I mean, it is going to be world class because I know what's in it. Yes. And um, if that can get out to the world to see what has been put together mm -hmm. with great, you know, 
thought and effort and of course capital just to, to make it happen right and it's going to be there i think it's going to be up for a, a year at least right i think it's actually close to two years yeah, that's that wonderful it's going to be up, that's fantastic which is going to give us a lot of opportunity for everything from you know virtual programming to in-person symposiums you name it and again i think there can be um i think there can be a lot of different disciplines involved so you know like Let's say you're a science guy and you don't really know much about art. Well, um, the science behind um, a lot of those works that were collected is pretty fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Do, uh, do you know if they're going to have any of the, the wax recordings? I don't know if that's... I can't say that I know that specifically. Yeah. You'll yeah. be asked that at some point, I'm sure, besides okay. just today. I don't know the answer either. All right. So, <laughs> um, so let's just talk a little bit kind of as we finish up, you've had a circuitous route to yep. what you do. Mm -hmm. What would you say to those individuals who are considering doing what you're doing as, you know, as far as curator then, mm -hmm. director of museums and mm -hmm. director of institutions? What kind of advice can you give them? Uh, the field has changed so dramatically in the now just over 30 years that I've been involved in it. Um, you know, uh, so <laughs> all of my uh, all of my highly educated friends will probably not appreciate this, but but I will say that um, success as as a museum director anyway is far less tied to the letters behind your name than it used to be, um, and I I think that uh, the experience and um, diverse perspectives that people from various fields bring to museums is increasingly important. Um, with uh, you're, you're going to interpersonal skills are, ju are just critical. Honestly, it's, it, it's how I make a lot of hires. It's, um, I'll tell you what I, I, I honestly hire people who, who have uh, very opposite skill sets than myself and then trust them to do what they do best. Um, I think, you know, being able to navigate difficult conversations uh, between um, audiences that have divergent viewpoints. It's like being a skilled um skilled with critical thinking and negotiation skills, it, it, it's absolutely critical. Um, so I, I, I don't like the term that people use for that, which is soft skills, because uh, again, I think they're vital. Um, so I'd say it's less, it's less, a, I'm living proof, it's less about the academic discipline that you choose um, than the choices you make and, and having your eyes open for um, opportunities and being willing to take a risk. Uh, and people will often say to me, are you still there? Wh where are you now? <laughs> um, because I have become adept at reinventing myself. Um, and I, you know, there's something to be said for being somewhere for 40 years and having that depth of knowledge but there's also a lot to be said for having a diverse knowledge base because throw me into a situation, a governance type, I've probably been there. <laughs> yeah, you've had to deal with a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it sounds like a, a career that is, um, you better want it if you want to do this job. You you better want it. Um, you know, my. My my husband often jokes that um, that I that I tricked him and um, he married the wrong kind of doctor and he's gonna <laughs> gonna be uh, more specific next time around. Um, you you gotta really love it to be director of a cultural institution because it's not a job; it's a lifestyle. Yeah, it is. You have a, you're on call all the time, basically. It's a lifestyle. Yeah, I mean, you came down here to do this. Right. I came down here to do this and, you know, like I go on vacation to Santa Fe and to an outsider, to my husband, it's going to look like I worked the whole time that I was there. But there's it, the, 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 the work and the pleasure are so commingled for me. I can't tell them apart. Yeah. The, the Western art world is full of such kind, warm people. And I just, I mean, oh my gosh, I can't imagine doing anything else that, 
the relationships that I've been able to build that I treasure. Yeah, yeah. And the artists, just being able to be around creative people. To me, that's always a joy. Exactly. <laughs> because they just they just have a different take on the world, mm -hmm. you know? And they see it differently, and they embrace it differently, and they bring joy, which is, you know, I mean, we can all use a little joy in this world, especially we, right yeah, now. Especially I think. right now, huh? yes. Any last words you'd like to partake to our audience? Uh, I'm just really grateful for the opportunity to talk with you and your audiences. And um, the one thing that Western Spirit has is that it's geographically desirable. So come visit us in Old Town Scottsdale. Yeah, it is. It's a gorgeous building. It is. It's just a gorgeous building. And, you know, I always go in there and I see something new every time. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not just Western art, so everyone knows. There's some great Native American material that is in there. There's a Hopi collection that's just out of this world. I think it's the best, quite frankly, in the world. And uh, you have upstairs the first phase, second phase, third phase, early Plains beadwork and, you know, intermixed with the paintings. And if you want a little a little preview, um, now, now audience members are going to hold me to this, but um, a little preview of something I think we might uh, focus on a little bit more in the future that's overlooked, which is um, contemporary indigenous work. Yeah. And I specifically mean uh, paintings and yeah. drawings. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they have some great ones too. Yes. They have some great neatos and uh, they have... Um, for shoulders, some fantastic ones. Um, there are a half a dozen really strong paintings mm -hmm. that are in there. They don't have a Chanta Begay yet, but we'll make sure that <laughs> happens at some point. Indeed. Yeah, considering I think he's one of the most important artists who happens to be native, uh, he should be in, in that museum for sure. And just a shout out to Shanto fans. I just saw the retrospective exhibit at the Wheelwright. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Thanks to you. Yeah. Uh, and it's magnificent. Yeah, he's, he's a genius. Yeah, he's, a, he's the real deal. So shout out to Shanto as well. <laughs> All right, James Burns, thank you so much. I look forward to uh, visiting your museum uh, on October 16th. If people want to go to the gala, what are the, do you know? They just have to join the museum and then pay whatever is exactly. required. Exactly. I believe you can uh, get tickets on the website. Yeah. So this one's going to be a good one to see because mm -hmm. we have this. This Curtis show is, is beyond you know, the pale. It really is the thing. Yep. And I'm excited to go see it. And I will see it, I bet, half a dozen times over whatever period of time. I hope so. Yeah. Oh, you will. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be calling you from okay. the and saying, James, you'll be like, I'm too busy. Oh, my God. This is a lot. Right. All right. Okay. Very good. James Burns, thank you again. Thank you, Mark. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.